Hey guys and welcome to another ZBrush video and this time still showing you a bunch of kick-ass techniques but it's a little different as I'm taking some of the techniques I've seen from the ZBrush sculpt of submissions that I thought were just absolutely incredible and then showing you guys how to do those. So from quick fur to chains to render techniques we've got quite a few tricks to go through so let's get to it. Alright, so first up we have Elliot Betancourt and or Betancourt, and Elliot's work looks really good for one main reason, smart use of existing materials and objects. Now in this case the rhino head and the body both come with ZBrush, so all he had to do was import them and combine them to create the general character you see here. That was very smart. Oh, and also he did actually have to do some posing and extra sculpting to get what we see here. So some actual skill is needed. It's not all just copy and paste. You do actually have to put in the work. Now, of course, the next thing that caught my attention was the fur. This again was made using existing materials. In this case, all he did was wrap a simple piece of geometry around the character and then use that to insert fur from a chisel brush to create the look. And let's actually go through how to actually do that. So first up, we have a model. Any model will do in this case. Next, we can make sure that there are no subdivisions. And after that, I'll press B, C, and then choose Curve, Strap, Snap. I'll also make sure that symmetry is off by pressing X and quickly wrap a curve around the model. By the way, I'm using a smaller brush size to create the curve for better control. And when I'm happy, I'll increase the brush size and click on the curve to increase its size. The size of a brush, by the way, dictates the size of the radius of the curve. And after that, I'll click off the curve to confirm my creation. Those dashed lines, by the way, mean you can edit the curve. Once they're gone, you can no longer edit the curve. It just becomes normal geometry. Next, I'll mirror and weld it. By the way, mirror is under deformation. And the mirror and weld option is under the geometry and modify topology menu. Yeah, one of the most used pair of buttons are on two different menus. Nice. Now since I want this to be separate, what I'm going to do is go down to split and then split mask points and then that way we can have this separated and then I'll mirror and weld this. Now you don't actually have to do this, but I'll just move this into place just to kind of give us a little bit of variation, but yeah, there we go. After that, I'll make sure we have enough geometry by either dynameshing or in this case subdividing with Ctrl D. And here I'll make sure we have a few million polygons so that there's more geometry to work with. After that, let's actually get to the main idea here, and we can do that by pressing B, C, then O for the Chisel Organic Brush. And here you'll find a new menu. And if you press M for Menu, you can select the fur brushes. And all we have to do is lay these down so they actually look like they've been sculpted. And that's it. Yeah, I spent more time explaining the curves than this. Alright, and you'll also want to switch Backface Masking on for this brush. It's Under Brush, Auto Masking, then Backface Masking. Now super important, make sure to switch this off when you are done because it can cause unnecessary problems if you aren't aware of it being on. Now again, backface masking makes sure that whatever you're doing on one side doesn't happen on the other side. This happens all the time if you have very thin geometry, so it's pretty useful. Now up next, just a super quick tip, if you want to create chains, you can insert a ring or any open shape and then press W to get out the gizmo and then while holding control, you can click and drag to create a copy. Then you can rotate that into place and then hold down control, then click and drag. So again, hold down control first, then click and drag with both the chains. And once you let go of control and continue dragging, you can create multiple copies. By the way, wherever you let go of control is where the geometry will copy from and keep that particular distance. So this is very useful if you want to repeat an object over and over again just to create some really quick geometry. In this case, chains. And after that, you can then use the customize menu to quickly bend and modify the chains if you want. And another quick tip, by the way, to create the flat look on the metal, you can either use the H Polish brush, BHP, or the Trim Smooth Border brush, which you can access by pressing the comma key, selecting brushes, trim brushes, and then Trim Smooth Border. Good lord. <laughs> by the way, I do have a video on creating metal wear and tear if you want more details on that. Links are in the description below, obviously. Alright, and that's it for that dude. Uh, up next we have David Arthur 3D and here the tentacles really caught my attention. And once again we have some clever use of techniques as opposed to raw sculpting which of course is more time consuming. And for those of you who aren't aware the, the sculpt off takes place within 3 hours so everyone here submitted their work within 3 hours which is pretty nuts. Anyway, back to the curves here. Uh, what David did was he used a low poly mesh and then retopologized it or rather just moved it around a bit to create a little template so he knows where to place the suction parts of the tentacles along the curve. Now this is a good idea and he, that, that is what he used but if you want a thousand suckers for example it would take forever to place so I use this method instead. Alright so first up this is what he did you can use a curve brush so what I'm going to do is press B C and then curve tube snap. After that I'll go to stroke curve modifiers and select size this will vary the size of the tube. 
Basically the curve will start out big, then taper linearly towards the point like I've shown here. If I did this instead, we would have a curve that starts small, increases in size, and then ends small again. Anyway, after that, I'll make sure to change the curve step to a slightly smaller number to get smaller rectangles on our tube. Basically, this is just more subdivisions along the axis. And this will make a little bit more sense later, so don't worry about it now. But basically, I'm trying to make sure that these polygons are more square as opposed to being rectangular. Now, in case you're wondering, is there an easier way or another way to do this with a little bit more control? And yes, there is. So what you can do is press W, okay, and then you can go to Customize, and then you have a bunch of primitives here. So one is the Cone 3D. So you can click on that, and here we have it. So you want to make sure you already have a primitive out that will basically replace that. And if we press Shift F, we can get out the polyframe mode. And here we can actually add, right, a little bit of loops to that. And we can also add or subtract sides. So you can have as little or as many as you want. Obviously, three will be the least because you can't have less than that. And you can keep going. So you can control how many you want. So maybe you know for a fact that you want 10 sides and you want maybe a few of these. So let's say 16 or 12, for example. Uh, we'll leave it at 13 right there you go all right and once you're satisfied with that you can just click on that again and then go to gizmo 3d and now you can use it to well any way you want really so yeah um again if you want more precision you probably wouldn't use zbrush for this you'd probably use blender or you'd use 3d max or my or something like that but yeah um this is pretty much as precise as you're gonna get in zbrush so yeah all right so next now that we've set everything up i'll actually draw out the curve and it doesn't have to be perfect we can inflate it later if we need and next i'll just drag the top out so it straightens out a little bit and then click on some geometry to get rid of the dashed lines after that i'll press w and select bend the curve here i'll click on the control points and drag this to twist the tentacle just to give it a little bit more dynamic shape and after that i'll drag this orange cone out to add more points and then move them as i see fit these orange points or these orange cones by the way will give you more orange points or control points and you can actively add and subtract control points without resetting the geometry which is great for dynamic control. Now after you've found a shape that works you can now press B Z M for Z modeler. You can then select polygroup option. By the way you have to hold down the spacebar or right click on a polygon to get the menu out. In this case I'm right clicking on a polygon selecting polygroup and then selecting poly loop so it affects a loop of polygons. Now when we click on them they will change color. We can do this to as many or as little rows as we want and after that I'll choose polygroup all, checkerboard, change the number to something below 50 so we have random blocks but more than 50% will be one color while the rest will be random. We do want a little bit of randomness to this so that's why I'm doing this. So yeah, I have three types of suckers and yeah, that's what you call these things on tentacles apparently. Anyway, make sure that they are slightly varied and not too high poly. I just created these separately, but again, they're pretty simple geometry. You don't need to see me creating them. Again, they're pretty simple. You can make them as complicated as you want or as simple, but again, try and keep them low poly. Not too low poly, of course. All right, after that, I'll go back to our actual tentacle and select nano mesh with Z modeler. Again, you want to hover over the mesh itself, hold down spacebar or right click to get this menu. And after that, I will press M for menu and select the first sucker. Next, I'll drag on the polygons to have one sucker for this poly group. In the nano mesh menu found here, I'll select fit. So the mesh fits on the square and this is why it needs to be square. So it aligns properly and I'll also select align by normals. So it's aligned properly. As you can see, there are a bunch of parameters here which you can change and I usually mess with the size, X, Y, and Z offset and the length, height, and width. Now, of course, you should experiment with the others just to see what you can get, but for the most part, these are the ones I mess with. Next, I'll press M again and select the second sucker and it always sounds kind of funny when I say that. And we'll do the same thing here. So by the way, nan the nano mesh menu has these arrows to cycle through which mesh you want to modify. So you can switch between them. And last, I'll select the third sucker and do the same thing here. Again, just using these modifiers, the XYZ offset, the length, height, and width. And I'm also making sure that we are aligning it to the normals. And next, all you need to do is go to inventory and select one to mesh for each group you created. The nano meshes aren't real geometry, by the way, until you do this. They're just there as a representation of what you can have. Oh, and also I would use the dam standard to create the ridges that you see here and other brushes just to create the organic look. But that's not really what this part of the tutorial was about. It's more about using nano meshes to create something a little bit more clever with the geometry that you have. All right, so that's it for this one. All right, so up next, a little bit of hard surface modeling. We have Layla Viscu and here it's just some awesome shape design mixed in with some simple but effective extrusion and shape techniques. All right, so let's get into it. Alright, so first up we have the metal plates and what you can do is mask an area using any mask technique. 
To mask, by the way, you hold down Ctrl and left click and drag, and to unmask something, you hold down Ctrl plus Alt and left click and drag. The masking will be black or white, depending on whether you're masking or unmasking something. After that, I'll make a duplicate and press Ctrl Shift plus E, E for elephant, and this will create a nice cut around the mask and also create a poly group. All right, and after you're done with that, what you want to do is press Ctrl Shift and click on this, and what it'll do is it'll kind of hide that. What you want to do is then go to Delete Hidden, and by the way, Delete Hidden can be found under Geometry, Modify Topology, and then we've got Delete Hidden right here. But as you can see, we have a little bit of topology that we don't want here, so in this case, I'm going to go down to Poly Groups, which is down here, then I'm going to go to Auto Group, it will auto group that, and then again, I'll Ctrl Shift click. That will isol isolate that, by the way, so you can just Ctrl Shift click and drag. And then what you want to do again is delete hidden. After that, I will go to geometry, Z remesher, and Z remesh the mesh with the default settings and change. Well, actually, I will change something. I'll change the half poly count and detect edges and keep creases. We don't want the creases to go away because we want those nice clean edges. I'll click on the button until the mesh is roughly low topology. And now we can use this as a base for all of our creations that come next. So the magic tool that we're actually going to use here is the extrude profile, BEP. And this works just like a curve brush, except here we can select a shape and that will be used to frame our plate, or armor in this case. To frame something, just go to the stroke menu, then curve functions, and make sure that only border is selected, and then hit frame mesh. In this case, it will frame the borders only. And in this case, we have two borders, on top and at the bottom. Now this will create a dashed line, a frame around the border, and all we need to do is click on the line and it will fill the edges for us. Again, make sure you have your curve brush selected, that way when you click on the dashed lines, it will actually do something. And again, you can adjust the size from here for more variation, and also the brush size to change the whole size. By the way, if you click on the line, then hold Ctrl and drag, you can create a twist on the curve. The bigger the brush, the more error will be affected, and it's not an exact size, but yeah, it's there if you want to use it. Also, the cyan brush, and I didn't really talk about this before, but the cyan brush controls the actual curve while the red brush controls the size. Cyan, the cyan brush, can only be accessed once you're on the curve itself. So if you hover on the curve, you'll see a cyan brush or the brush turn cyan. And red can only be accessed when you're off the actual curve. So in other words, when you're off on the menu somewhere or within the canvas. So do keep that in mind. These are separate tools that work in specific conditions and do specific things. So if you want the cyan brush to just move things around, make sure you're actually hovering on the curve. And if you want the red brush to maybe control size or add another curve or click away from it, make sure you're off of the curve and not on the curve. So again, they're two different brushes. And as for the plate thickness, you can easily control that with dynamic subdivisions. Here, all you have to do is press D, D for dynamic, and it will ask if you want dynamic subdivisions. After pressing yes, you can control the subdivisions and the thickness in this menu. There's quite a bit of stuff here, but all you need to know is that here you can control the number of subdivisions, and if you change the thickness, you can add thickness to the geometry. And after that, you can disable post subdivision. This means you can now control the edge smoothness. We can do that under the crease menu. Bring the torrents to around 70 maybe, and then click uncrease all, and then crease again. Then you can change the crease number to something low, like one or two. The higher this number is, by the way, the sharper the edges, and the lower it is, the more rounded edges you'll get. Now in our case, it doesn't really matter as the edges are covered, but I thought I'd just throw this tip in here. By the way, this geometry isn't real until you press apply over here. So again, it's kind of made up geometry. It's just a representation of what it can be until you press apply. Now you see these curves over here, these are pretty cool, and you can create these curves using the extrude profile again, but this time I'll change the size so it starts off small, moves towards a bigger size, then tapers back down again. Now you'll notice that we need it to snap to the surface, so I'll choose Curve Cube Snap, draw a line that I like, and then choose BEP again to get the profile, and then click to create these curves. Now you can do this as many times as you need to create some really cool shapes. And of course you can change the profile if you want, for now I'm just using a very basic diamond shape, but you can use whatever you want, there's a bunch here. Again, you can change the profiles by pressing M, it'll bring up a menu, and you can just select them as you want. And you can keep clicking on the dashed lines to keep updating them. By the way, we have a setting called Depth Setting, and it's under Brush and Depth, and this will control how deep these curves sit. The lower the circle, the more embedded they are, and vice versa. You can adjust this setting before and after laying down curves, then click on the curve to update it. This will work for most settings as long as the dashed lines are visible. So remember that clicking on the mesh or drawing out another set will get rid of these lines. So be careful that you're actually confident in what you're drawing before you move on. 
Oh, and another quick tip here for all curve brushes, not just the snap ones. For cylindrical objects, if you drag the line outside of the mesh and hold shift, it will wrap a perfect line around the mesh so you can easily create bracelets, wraps, armbands, etc. It's a really great time saver, by the way. Alright, and also in case you're wondering, I would create the hair strand using the snake hook brush, so BSH, in conjunction with Sculptress Pro, which is here by default, or if you can't find it, you can find it under Stroke, Sculptress, and then you can activate that. So by the way, Sculptress, in case you don't know, it basically adds geometry as you draw. So the smaller the brush size, and again, this is brush size dependent, the smaller the brush size, the more geometry it adds and vice versa. So be sure to switch it off when you are done, because it can do things you might not want. All right, and that's it for that one. So up next, let's move on to Marcus Hertel. And here again, we have some really clever use of shapes. And in Marcus's case, it's very simple. And also he made use of some clever color to create this 2D looking character. And so this will be a quick one. So just like the plates, I'll use masking to create these flat shapes. And in Mark's case, he used low poly sculpting, but I think it's a little too tedious. So I'll use this instead. I'll get the general shape I want and then press Control Shift E again. And then I'll use the Z remesher once again to get it to a lower level so it's easier to manage. And then I can kind of move these as I see fit. I'll then use dynamic subdivs like I did before to get this up to what I want and then apply it so we can actually use the geometry. By the way, to paint color, you can either hold spacebar or right click to get the color menu. You can select the color and then press BPA to get the paintbrush and this will paint whatever color you have. And another quick note here, ZBrush uses vertex painting and what that means is that the higher the poly count, the more clear your edges will be. The lower the vertex count or poly count, the fuzzier your edges will be. So in other words, you want more resolution to have a cleaner edge. After that, I'll reuse the shapes for the eyebrows and create new ones for the horns. And the head is actually using, he's using 3D shapes and he colored them using flat colors to make them look flat. The same for the eyes and the nose. So for this effect, what you can do is use the flat material or the clay material, which is what I think he used. And by the way, to apply an, a material to an object without applying color, you can just use the M or just make sure M is selected on the menu over here and nothing else. And after you're done with that, you can click on full object, which is found under color and then full object. Now, before you do that, make sure that the material you want is selected and don't switch to any other materials. That way you can fill it with that material. And then when you switch over to other materials, it won't change because you've now assigned that material to this particular object. All right, and yet another quick tip, and this time on images in ZBrush, what you want to do to get an image out in ZBrush is you can press Z, right? And if you don't have an image, by the way, this won't work, so I'm going to show you how to do that. And you can press Shift Z to hide it. So Shift Z and Z to bring up the spotlight. That's what this thing here is. And again, to actually get this in, yes, let me just delete it really quickly. So what you want to do is go to texture. You want to go to import and then import an image from wherever. It'll show up here after that. So what you want to do after that is then click on the image and then you want to click add to spotlight. This will add it to the spotlight. You can add as many or as little as you want. Then you can scale it, which is really useful. And in this case, what I want to do is click on paint. Then you can click on control and alt and then you can click and drag on this area here. Now it's not going to work because I already just did it. Um, but let me just see if I can do this here instead. There we go. So I'm going to click on paint and then control and alt and then click and drag. And you notice this area here is being filtered away. Basically, it's taking whatever color I'm clicking on and dragging and basically eliminating it. So it's giving it a see-through effect. You can then click off of paint and then move this. That way you have this in position and then you can click on this um, scale. Right to scale it, you can pin it, you can... Uh, there's a bunch of things I have a... <laughs> I have a video on how to use the spotlight, but basically you have scale, you have rotate and you have paint. Okay, and then another one that's very important is the opacity. What you want to do is bring the opacity all the way up for this one, especially. Then I'm going to press Z just to get rid of that. And actually another cool thing that you can do with Z, so in other words, Z to bring up the spotlight. Again, Shift Z to hide that if you don't want that in the way. And then Z again to bring up the spotlight. While Z is active, um, if you notice here on my palette, if I hold C, C for color, right, it'll actually pick up the color. So here we have like a blue, it'll pick it up, there it is there. 
if I click press C again while I'm hovering over this, it'll basically sample the colors. So that is very useful. Okay, so just like that. Then you can press Z and then you can go to here, for example. And another thing you want to make sure that you do whenever you have images in ZBrush like this out, you want to go, yeah, this is a lot of work. You want to go to brush, you want to go all the way down to samples. And you want to make sure that spotlight projection is off. If it's on, what will happen is while you're trying to sculpt, nothing will happen. Okay, um, you can move stuff, as you can see. But you can't sculpt on it and that's because you basically it's trying to sculpt this image onto this mesh which you don't want obviously you don't need that so if you do need that you can keep spotlight projection on but since we don't need that i'm going to go here and keep, switch it off so just make sure that you have it off pretty much all the time you only want it on when you want to have this image embedded into that mesh which again i don't want all right so now that i've explained that um let's say i want to change the color of this beard so i had it pretty dark here right like that and what I want is that color there. So I'm going to press Z to bring out the spotlight. I'm going to press C for color to sample that color. Then I'm going to go all the way down here to masking. Okay, so masking. I'm going to come all the way down here to mask by color. I'm going to click on mask by poly paint. All right. And then I'm going to click on one of these gray boxes here. Click and drag into that area. So the area you want to mask basically. So it's pretty accurate. And we also have a tolerance level here. So I think 30 is okay. I'll just leave it at that for now. So basically click and drag on the color you want to mask, let go, press okay, it'll then mask that. I'll then shift or rather control click. And that way we've got this part, this piece unmasked. And now that I have that color selected, I can then go to my menu over here under color. And I can click on full object. Then I can clear that mask by control dragging. And there we go. We have pretty much the exact color there. And let me just make sure that we're on uh clay there you go <laughs> now it's the exact color okay there you go so yeah that's just a really quick way to bring images into zbrush to use the colors to your advantage and also to mask things so yeah pretty cool all right so like i said that was a pretty quick one so up next we have sarah wild art and here we can see some really awesome renders with a really cool dragon like creature and of course i really wanted to know how she did this so let's get started on that Alright, so first things first, we have the scales and the horns and the teeth, and it might seem nuts, but really these are just five separate meshes that have been repeated over and over again to make it look like complicated sculpting, but really all it is is clever use of the insert multi-mesh brush and positioning. Right now, I'm pretty sure she actually wore sculpted a few of these scales and spikes, but since we now know about the chisel brushes, we can use them instead. So yeah, I'll make sure I have a high poly cube and then I'll use B, C and then I to get the chisel creatures brush out. So here we can create some IMMs or insert multi meshes from them. Basically, all I'm doing here is dragging out the brush on a high poly cube, customizing the shape to my liking and then slicing the pieces I don't need. And then I'll redynamesh it so the mesh isn't too high. Remember, we will be using this mesh as an insert mesh, so it can't be in the millions of polygons for each spike and scale, etc. So what I'm doing here is once I'm happy with the shapes, I'll have to make sure to give them proper names and then press B for brush and then press make insert multi mesh. This will turn all the subtools into an insert mesh brush. So be careful not to do it with a bunch of tools you don't want. You can now save this brush if you want by pressing B and then save as. And if you want to, you can save it in the program files, Maxon ZBrush 2024 or whatever version you have. Z starts up and then brush presets. The brush will now always start up with ZBrush and you can find it over here in this menu by pressing B. Now make sure you don't do this with every brush you create because you don't want to fill up the menus with a bunch of nonsense brushes you created just for fun. So just make sure you actually keep the brushes you want in that folder and not all of them. Alright and that was all the hard work done. Now all you have to do is layer the scales manually or use the nano mesh technique that I showed to repeat the scales as needed. If you want to do this just use the curve strap snap brush to snap some geometry to the area you want and then add the scales to them using the nano mesh function on that strip. After that we can now add the teeth and the horns and hey it's looking pretty good for almost no sculpting right? Okay, so now that we can actually use our new brushes, what we can do is just click and drag them out and depending on the direction you want to go. So in this in this case, I want it to be in this direction. And what you can also do is go to the brush menu and then you can also go to depth and make sure to pull that down a little bit. Maybe you just want it to be just a little bit more embedded in there. And here you'll notice that it also kind of depends where you're facing. So for example, if I do that or do this, it's kind of surface dependent. And also another thing you'll notice if I come over here, for example, and pull this out you'll notice that it's kind of uh, you know it's not really sticking to where i want it to so there for example these edges are pushing out and what you can do is you can go to b m and then you can go to t right so bmt uh, for move topological and you, and you can manually move these into place right so like that 
and that's a little bit of a hassle <laughs> what you can do is press b again get your insert mesh brush back out again and what you can do is you can go down to brush you can go to modifiers okay and then you can go into projection strength so this here will basically try and project what's happening so for example if i uh, So yeah, unfortunately ZBrush did crash. <laughs> it crashed on me. So basically what I was saying is that you can go to scale and then you can use the projection strength over here to kind of project this onto here. And I don't want to switch it on again just in case ZBrush crashes again. But yeah, basically it'll project onto here. And ZBrush being ZBrush, you, you don't know what'll happen. So yeah, that's one way of doing that. Or you can just move it manually into place. And here's a little trick by the way, if you use the move topological and you bring the size all the way down to one, what you can do is click and drag and this will move each piece individually. So kind of like that. And that way you don't have to kind of distort the mesh as you're moving it. So there we go. And then I'll just move that into place, make the brush a little bit bigger. And now I can just kind of move that into place there. And of course I am distorting it a little bit, but again, the whole idea is to kind of teach you the technique. And then you can kind of do whatever you want within reason. The next thing that caught my attention, of course, was the slime that we see here. And I'm pretty sure all she did was manually place some curves and she customized them. But a really cool thing you could use instead would be the slime bridge functionality. Now slime bridge works by masking two areas and no, it can't be one or three, it has to be two. And then it creates a bridge between those two areas. So it's really that simple. Just like a normal bridge would create a bridge between two areas, this does the same. Um, the tension slider, by the way, controls how curved the bridges are. So in other words, more tension equals a straighter line. Less tension equals more curved. The bridges deal with roughly how many bridges there are. By the way, if you say one or two bridges, it might create one or two, but that just depends on the geometry and also the, the resolution. So it kind of depends. So just because you say one or two doesn't mean they'll only do one or two. And yeah, so after that, we have branches and capillaries. Those will just add more branches to the bridges and capillaries to the branches. The capillaries, by the way, will add horizontal lines to the branches, kind of like a web of sorts. Basically, the more capillaries and branches, the more chaotic your bridge will be. In this case, I don't want too much chaos, so I'll keep the capillaries at 1, the branches really low, and the bridges roughly low as well. The tension will actually be quite high because the slime can be quite curved, but in some cases, it's not too much. So you can just experiment and go back and forth on this. And last but not least, we have the actual render itself. It looks really good because of a few simple things. So one, the colors are simple, only about three to four main colors with some slight variations here and there. Two, there are quite a bit of details to show off thanks to all those nooks and crannies that have been sculpted in to make it look more detailed than it actually is. And three, there's a good shine, vignette and blur added to the render to really help draw your attention to the face. So how do we do this? Right, in this case, I'll use my own model and first let's set up the camera view. To do this, you can find an angle you like, make sure that perspective is on or off depending on what you want. And if you want, you can change the focal length. You can change it here under draw. And I just remember that the lower the number, the more fish-eyed it can be. And the higher the number, the more orthographic it gets. After that, we can go to the movie menu and then timeline and then show. On the timeline, you can click to save the key. This will remember your camera position here and you can move the camera as many times as you want and then save it by clicking on the timeline. After that, you can use the arrow keys to move between camera angles and to delete the keys, just drag them into the canvas and this will be deleted. To get the actual render, we'll first have to go through the render menu and here you'll find a bunch of things to change, but let's just stick with one tab for now. And that will be the BPR filters tab. If we press shift out to render the model, you'll find the default render. But if we click on the line box filter, we have a bunch of templates to help render our model like a sketch, a painting, a pen and ink drawing, etc. Now, before we actually move with any of these pieces here, what I'm going to do is click on lighting and I'm just going to make sure that we have the lighting that kind of just where I want it to be. So in this case, I'm going to go again to the light menu and just kind of click and drag on this piece to make sure that it's in the angle that I kind of want it to be. That's just so the lighting is actually in place. You can add more lights, but for now, I'm just going to use one just to keep it simple. All right, so after that, instead of using these pre-made filters, what we're going to do is make our own. So let's have a look at these filter buttons. So first you need to know is that the open circle enables the filter. Next, we have the filter type, which we can change. And then we also have the blend mode, kind of like in Photoshop, you've got different types of blend modes. And after that, we have the intensity of the filter and the opacity to lessen the effect or heighten the effect of the filter. The other important button here is modifiers. These are modifiers specific to some filters. Not all filters have modifiers, by the way, so don't freak out when you see that it is grayed out. 
The other important button is masking. The mask value of zero means that the filter affects both the background and the mesh. At minus one, it affects only the background and at one, it affects only the mesh. Now, just to actually show you what this means, let's demonstrate this and show you how it actually works. So first, let's make sure to actually activate the first filter by clicking on it so we have an open circle and also make sure that your object is rendered. Press Shift R to render it and that way we can use the filters. That way they'll actually show up. If you don't do this, they won't show anything so you won't be able to see what you're doing. All right, so first up, let's select Paint and again, make sure that the filter is activated by clicking on the circle. It needs to be open. After that, select a color. Here, I'll just select red so you can see what I'm doing. And if we change the mask to one, it will only color the mesh. And if we select minus one, it will only affect the background. And like I said, zero will affect both the background and the mesh. But since I only want to affect the background, I'll choose minus one. I'll then select the color I want like charcoal. And next, let's activate filter two and customize that. This time I'll select vignette and change the color to black. I'll also change the mask to less than one. So it'll affect more of the background than the mesh. And also you can notice that we can modify this. So things like the vignette size, the position, the roundness, etc. It's pretty self-explanatory. So what you can do is experiment with that on your own. Up next we have Orton and this will brighten up the scene. But since I don't want too much of the background being affected, I'll change the mask value closer to one so the background isn't too light. Up next is material shading and here I'll set the texture to toy plastic. So we have that kind of shine effect. And just so it's not too much, I'll play with the opacity so it's not too shiny, so it's not being affected too much by that material. So the next filter I want to use is, I'm going to activate it first, is Sharpen. Okay, so it's over here. And if you go into Minus Sharpen, it'll basically blur it. So I want it around about 100%. All right, so there it is. The next one I want is Blur, so I'm going to activate that. And we want to choose Blur, which is the second one. And we want to go Blur all the way up. And then we're going to come down here to depth and we can bring that depth up by uh, let's say 0.6 i think that's fine then i can take depth a and then click and drag to the eye because that's where i want the focal point to be and then let go then i'll go to depth b click and drag to maybe the legs okay so now as you can see it's kind of blurring all of this and then keeping that in focus but it's quite it's a bit much so what i want to do is bring the opacity down so maybe about there right so there we go and if we, you can switch it on and off just to see what that does if it's too distracting then obviously switch it off but again you can bring the opacity down and i think yeah that should be good enough next we can go to noise so i'm going to activate this one right by making it an open circle and then i want noise so there's two different types of noise there's noise one which i forgot where it is and there's noise two over here. oh here it is <laughs> and there's noise two so let's activate noise two and yeah it's pretty nuts and here we can select two colors so let's select maybe uh, a red and we can select like a green maybe Yeah, about there maybe yeah okay actually you know what? i'll swap these colors all right and obviously this is way too much so what i'm going to do is bring down the opacity to something like three maybe a little bit higher so yeah pretty high and again it gives the whole thing that filter effect but maybe you just want it on the uh on the character then you can give it to one or minus one it'll just be the background but in this case i'll make it slightly mainly the background because it's minus one and i'll bring it a little bit closer to zero so that way it's affecting the character just a little bit. And hey, that's it. That's our render done. And yeah, I think it looks pretty cool. So what we can do is we can save this. So I'm going to save that really quickly. And yeah, that is pretty much it. Now, of course, you can activate this and add as many as you want. I mean, don't go too crazy, right? You've got contrast, you've got outlining edges if you want. So this will literally outline the edge, which really adds a nice sort of cartoony look to it almost. And of course, you can bring that up or bring that down. And it's in red because... Here it's selected red, so obviously we can make that white if we want, right? You can do as, like, there's quite a few options here, so really you can go pretty nuts. And again, you can save it and load it, and let me just switch that off. And yeah, that is what it looks like. Let's just have a look at the default render there really quickly. So this is kind of what we have. The default render, by the way, if you just want to have the default render, just go to filter, and then just double click on the default render. Okay, but again, I'll press shift R, so this is what we had, and this is what we have now. So yeah, quite a bit of a difference there. And yeah, I quite like it. So that is it for this video. Quite a lot of stuff to go through, quite a lot of tips and tricks. And it took me quite a while to make it. So like if you liked it, dislike it. If you didn't, let me know what you guys thought in the comments. And subscribe if you really like my content. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.